I'm Tommy Thompson and welcome to Design Dive, my game design series as part of AI in Games. In this episode I wanted to talk about my experiences of playing Dark Souls 2, Scholar of the First Sin, and my musings on its design both from an AI and gameplay perspective. One of the earliest episodes of Design Dive was my journey through the original Dark Souls, my toxic relationship with it, and the many systems laced within its design that inadvertently caused it. As we return to the franchise, there are significant changes laced throughout the game that address some of these elements, so let's dive in and explore it in detail. Long-term viewers of the show will know that back in 2016 I released a Design Dive episode about the original Dark Souls. It was an analysis of the deterministic nature of the game and how it is reliant on a variety of simple AI behaviours that are robust yet sufficiently repetitive to craft an experience that can prove harrowing on first passing. However, it expects players to gradually hone their skills and learn more of the world of Lordran through experimental and experiential play. Now that was the original intent of that video and it's been popular enough, but returning to the game was also a means through which to attain some closure with my emotional connection to it. That episode was released five years to the month of my father's death, and given I was playing Dark Souls for the first time when he died, my relationship with the game in turn developed into something twisted and unhealthy. So it wasn't until late 2016 before I dared play the game again and I used my Design Dive series as the lens through which to approach it once more. I played through it again, I had a much more enjoyable experience with it this time around, and learned a lot more of the Dark Souls lore as well as improving my understanding and skill of the game. Not that you'd notice from reading the comments section, but I should know better than to do that. I then toyed with the idea of playing Dark Souls 2, the sequel that is, from reading around online, much maligned compared to its predecessor. A game arguably constructed more by business necessity of having a sequel to a worldwide sensation than a more balanced creative endeavour, with Bloodborne being the real follow-up in many respects. But I gotta admit, part of me was really hesitant to go through it all again. It's the one time I had a sense of trepidation in returning to a franchise. I mentioned in my first video some of the design principles used in Dark Souls core gameplay loop can get their hooks in you to a point it can take on a will of its own, and in my first playthrough, it kinda did that. Games are reliant on that core compulsive nature of play, and I was reluctant to take the plunge lest I knew that I was in a healthy state going into it. In hindsight, I'd overreacted, but at the same time I was a little scared by it all. Now I can imagine some of you thinking, how can you be scared to play a video game? But I'd become incredibly cognizant of the psychological impact the last few years had over me the efforts taken to lift that metaphorical weight from my shoulders, and how Dark Souls had been both a friend and foe in that process. So in spring of last year, I finally took the plunge. I'd just released my first commercial game, Sure Footing, on Steam, which, like AI and games, stemmed from a period of reflection after my dad's death. Both projects arose from a desire to do something new and fresh that, whether they be successful or not, I sought to enjoy and learn from the experiences and be able to look back and say, hey, I did that. The catharsis of seeing this thing transition from dumb idea to a game people were buying and playing was wonderful, and during my first quiet Sunday in months, I booted up Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin. Now if you're not familiar, Scholar of the First Sin is the updated version of Dark Souls 2, much like the Prepare to Die edition is a refined and improved version of the original Dark Souls, each carrying additional DLC, balanced tweaks and mechanical changes. However, Scholar of the First Sin is a more significant overhaul of mechanics, systems and level design from the original Dark Souls 2 in an effort to resolve issues raised from the original game's launch. So yeah, bear in mind that my experience is based solely on this version. However, I have done quite a bit of research in identifying the differences between the two. As I ventured into the land of Drang Lake, I was actually taken aback by the design of the game and some aspects of AI behaviour that completely changed how I felt about it as I went through it. It didn't feel like the first Dark Souls, and I was okay with that. And it all comes back to the point I made in my original episode, 
Dark Souls' philosophy of success is driven by your actions within the world and the rate at which you receive rewards for your activity. The game gradually rewards players through experiential play, but the kicker to that is the compulsion loops laced throughout it. Dark Souls is fairly unique in that it strips a lot of medium-term reward signatures from the game. You get the immediate rewards of defeating enemies, but beyond that it maintains a distance between you achieving the next milestone until one or several bosses are destroyed. Plus, the punishing respawn mechanics strip much of your sense of progression every single time. Even more so if you then get flustered only to rush out and make the same mistakes again. But despite all that, it's the experimentation and exploration of the world that is the true reward, and helps bridge the gaps between major milestones in a way that we just don't often think about. Now, this delayed and often subversive reward system is, for many players, the core of the Dark Souls experience. But going into Scholar of the First Sin cold, I was a little hesitant of whether that is something I personally wanted to see pushed further. That was my fear taken form, given it's the focal point from which my toxic relationship I built with the original game came from. But what really took me by surprise in Scholar of the First Sin is instead of exacerbating this further, the game does the opposite. There's a continued emphasis on establishing signposts for progression. It lets you know that you're progressing in a way that is more obvious, but in some cases is still fairly nuanced. All the while relying on your knowledge of the original game, and maybe of Demon's Souls too, which I've sadly never played. There are three highly evident ways in which Scholar of the First Sin reinforces this existing long-term reward structure, each of which actually inject or more clearly establish the medium-term loops that already hide within Dark Souls. In each instance, there are aspects of Scholar of the First Sin's design that, depending on your perspective, are either welcome innovations on the original's formula, or feel like a step backwards given this innovation that I so describe feels more conventional. I totally understand if upon hearing me out, you realise this is why you don't like Dark Souls 2, but for me, it alleviated my trepidation given it's providing something new and fresh that isn't so aggressively pandering to the original's design. So here it is, the three key points. The topology of the map of Drang Lake, the variation in boss designs and mini-boss placement, lastly the deviation from the deterministic nature of Soul's enemy placement. So let's walk through each of these elements and explain what is, for me, some of the more interesting decisions Scholar of the First Sin makes. Once we complete the opening segment of the game, we find ourselves in the land of Majula, sitting atop a cliff face looking out towards the ocean. Much like the original Firelink Shrine, from here we can venture out into the wider world, however the mood, aesthetic and structure of Majula, in conjunction with the layout of the world map, give something that feels more direct and regimented. The original Dark Souls is an expansive open world that is connected in a variety of different ways. The bonfire and Firelick Shrine enables you to access the Undead Burg, the Catacombs, the New Londo Ruins, and Blight Town. But each in turn allows you to go farther out into the world, and in time can build cycles of exploration that bring you back to the beginning. The boss key episode of Dark Souls over on Game Maker's Toolkit goes into this in much more depth, and I'd recommend anyone who hasn't seen it to go check it out. The most apparent change between Dark Souls 1 and 2 is that while the original was more of an interconnected graph, the sequel feels more like spokes on a wheel. You take one path, and you push down it as far as you can, such as from Majula, through the Shaded Woods, to Aldia's Keep, the Dragon Airy, and the Dragon Shrine, but ultimately, you need to come back to Majula again. This is only made possible, really, thanks to the ability to teleport at bonfires, an ability not enabled in the original Dark Souls until players acquire the Lord Vessel, but in Dark Souls 2, it's available from the beginning. This is pretty much a requirement since unlike the original game, you can't level up at bonfires, and instead have to continually revisit the Emerald Herald, who also acts as something of a narrator of the fiction in order to boost your stats. Plus, there are merchants and other characters who continue to populate the region and make it a useful location for resources and boosting abilities. Whilst I feel this robs the game of its more organic and lived-in feel, there is some value in adopting this process and I later learned that it shares a lot of similarities with the original Demon Souls. One of the major drawbacks is of course the lack of any real need for the world's interconnectivity, as well as shortcuts through areas of the world you've recently explored. Sure, some of them still exist, in places like the Lost Bastille and the Undead Crypt, but in most instances 
Once you've visited a location for the first time, you may seldom ever walk the full route back there, given instead you'll just teleport. But it also allows you to reach out as far as you can in a region, make some progress and return to it instantly. It's a twisted compromise between providing a streamlined method for players to prioritise specific tasks and building a world that feels lived and breathed in. I feel like the world feels less organic in its composition and more mechanically structured as a world of video game set pieces than one born of methodical narrative. But all that said, the great success of this is that on completing your journey, whether it be to fight the Rotten in the Black Gulch or Velstad the Royal Aegis in the Undead Crypt, you must always return to Majula. Each strand of the map stems from this hub, but in Majula we find peace but also signs of growth and progression. It's actually injected a medium term reward loop, because you can effectively see that this spoke of the wheel is now complete and you can move on to the next one. The thing is that the original Dark Souls has some of this laced within its design, but the feedback isn't obvious. Once you complete the game, you realise that killing the Bell Gargoyles, the Gaping Dragon and the Chaos Witch Quelag are the first medium term loot brought to completion, but the game never really signposts this to you as clearly as Dark Souls 2 does. This is not just because of the more organic nature of the map, but the fact that any bonfire becomes your base of operations for a period of time. You grind that region, return back, level up, reverse hollowing and move on. Whereas in Dark Souls 2, the need to continually return to Majula establishes it as your base of operations and your home away from home. All of this is reinforced by how serene and calming Majula can be. It's a place of twisted beauty, of wrecked homes and destitution against the calming waves of the ocean and the setting of the sun. Its haunting but nonetheless calming music helps prepare you for going back out there again. You know this is a safe place, all the while being able to see locations such as the Huntsman's Copse, the Forest of Fallen Giants, and Hades' Tower of Flame in the distance. The second element of the map design that reinforces these elements of progression is actually related to the placement of the AI characters. It's a small but significant change as enemy placement shifts throughout the experience and forces us to relearn areas we've already visited, which in turn is another progression indicator. In the original Dark Souls you would eventually learn where all the enemies were positioned. Every time you revisit a bonfire, the enemies spawn once more and always in the same position. So in order to reach that boss, you'd have to learn your way through the space and that made returning to these locations much easier given you would optimise the route in your head knowing full well whether to worry about a given enemy doing you damage. Plus, certain enemies wouldn't return to the world once the area boss was defeated, but in Scholar of the First Sin, the placement of enemies in areas we've since conquered begins to shift. The placement of enemies can change in a given region or their behavioural state shift depending on certain actions you've completed in the main questline. This is readily evident when you visit Hades Tower of Flame given when you visit early on there are several knights sitting idle in the map. These characters are docile and largely ignorant to you and your behaviour lest you aggro them, but upon defeating the Dragon Rider, they will later become hostile towards you when you return to the region. It all comes back once more to clearly communicated progression. This isn't the only time this happens in Scholar of the First Sin either. The world is laced with these small minute changes to enemy positioning that forces you to reevaluate your understanding and build new strategies for when you revisit. Now, as I mentioned, you tend to burrow down the particular paths of the map before you get the next one, however there is still a need to return to specific regions and it not only maintains novelty but again reinforces the sense of progression. Something's different, something's changed, and that tells you not only to keep your guard up but that arguably you're doing the right thing. But conversely, you can use this established knowledge to game the system a little bit through use of the bonfire ascetic. This item, when burned at a particular bonfire, resets the area not just to its original state, often respawning mini-bosses and even full-fledged bosses, but upping the difficulty of that area of the game such that you can tackle it again as if you're playing New Game Plus. This works on two levels, one that you can rely on your existing knowledge and growing skill to clean up again and require more souls and items, but it also adds new progression rewards in the form of new enemies. The more you level up certain areas, new phantom enemies also appear in the region and force you to really challenge your established knowledge. It's a fun embellishment of an existing system that rewards your progression and it allows you to exploit it. <laughs> 
The third aspect of the reward structures comes down to the placement of bosses as well as the distribution and design of boss types themselves. This is really due to both the sheer number of boss battles and the distribution between parry laden and dodge and evasive combat. The bosses are broken up into two distinct types. The ones where you have to dodge a lot of attacks and then get in close, such as the Last Giant, the Old Iron King, the Covetous Demon, the Royal Rat Authority, the Demon of Song and the Ancient Dragon, where the focus is on dodging attacks rather than block and parry and those feel a lot more akin to that seen in the first game. The Dark Souls bosses were often a real challenge, given you had to make sure you were keeping your character load light so you could evade when necessary or if you wanted tool up on the heaviest gear and hold your ground. But one of the more frustrating elements of this was that one of the key skills of the main game progression cannot be utilised. Parrying. If you've seen my first Dark Souls video, I talk about how the game deliberately laces itself with numerous parryable enemies, most notably the Black Knights, as means to train you for the fight with Lord Gwyn at the end, because Gwyn's attacks are parryable. It's an interesting risk reward system throughout both games that allows you to take what seems like a gamble at first, but with practice a fairly safe one, that will open up the enemy's defences for an attack that deals major damage. In fact, Lord Gwyn is the only boss enemy in Dark Souls that you can parry, at least to my knowledge. However, the number of bosses you can parry in Dark Souls 2 is significantly larger than in the first game. It becomes a much more critical element of combat, given that there are so many more humanoid enemies that are parryable. The Dragon Rider, the Pursuer, the Ruined Sentinels, the Lost Sinner, the Skeleton Lords, Felstad, heck, even the Throne Watcher and Defender can be parried. Yet, interestingly, two that cannot be parried are Nishandra, the final boss, and the Scholar of the First Sin, the final final boss. Although, to be fair, parrying a tree seems a bit mean. But all in all, the game rewards parrying so much more than before by lacing it throughout not just regular NPCs, but also the bosses too. It's a rewarding element of the game for me, given I worked hard during my second Dark Souls run to master parrying in preparation for Gwyn, and now it's proving a valuable asset throughout Dark Souls 2. Plus, I do love how ridiculous it is that I can rush the likes of Velstad and parry his attacks when you consider he's like three times my size. In addition, the actual number of bosses and mini bosses increases from the first one, and I feel like that's tied into the progression once more. More clearly signposting that you're making progress, but in Scholar of the First Sin, we see a lot of mini bosses repeated and that asset reuse, while smart, detracts once again from the novelty and exploration the game thrives on, especially when you have optional bosses like the Belfry Gargoyles, who look and behave very similar to the Bell Gargoyles of Dark Souls, plus the Old Dragon Slayer, who's pretty much a bargain bin ripoff of Ornstein. Oh, and both of those bosses are parryable too. All that said, none of it is as bad as the sequence in the Demon Ruins from the original Dark Souls full of Taurus and Capra demons. So these three changes I feel helps invigorate the game for me, but I recognise that they also risk making Dark Souls a little more conventional and, dare I say it, safe. But I think it's a healthy choice. Not just to differentiate the two games from one another, but it also challenges the misconception of Dark Souls difficulty as a safe space within which to embrace macho elitist dogma. And I think, if the game went down the route of being more punishing, potentially to a point of being unfair, that would eventually happen. However, as mentioned, the changes seem to deny Dark Souls 2 of the mystery and holistic quality of the first game that made it so endearing. It's an interesting compromise, potentially due to the change of creative leads on the project, given Souls series creator Hidetaka Miyazaki was working on Bloodborne at the time, with this game directed by Tomohiro Shibuya and Yui Tanimura. Was this a compromise on their part, or a deliberate decision that felt more true to their vision? Who knows? But I prefer the idea of the latter, given it's clear that Dark Souls 2 does seek to establish its own identity from its predecessors. But while I have a lot of praise for these changes, there are elements around the combat against the enemy AI characters that either felt frustrating, or I'm still unsure whether it's a good idea or not. Some of this is partially because it's breaking away from an established element of the previous game in a way that I feel is incongruous, but also sometimes innovating in ways that make no real sense or feel a tad laboured. While I like the addition of the knights in Heidi's Tower of Flame, we're able to learn their positions as we move through the area and remember it for future reference when things kick off and they start to attack. But one thing Scholar the First Sin seems to revel in is having default enemy positions in obscure and awkward corners of the map, often behind you, with the intent of catching you off guard. 
It's a subtle difference from the first Dark Souls, where enemies are often just out of sight in nooks and crannies along the main path. In that instance, it's punishing you for not being more methodical as you explore the space trying to catch you out. Whereas in Scholar of the First Sin, I frequently notice the enemies appearing behind you, often as a result of an event trigger in the world, where I walked into a room or opened a door and then something attacks from behind. It's really noticeable in the path up to Huntsman's Corpse, where enemies repeatedly appear from spawn points rather than already in the world. Even when this was done in, say, Undead Burg in the first game, you could already see enemies hanging off the sides if you look carefully. You were being told to pay attention and respect the dynamics of the world, whereas in this instance, it feels less like a cohesive design intent and more the meat and potatoes of a video game production. Plus, and I realise I'm going to sound like a massive hypocrite given my earlier point, but the number of enemies that can parry you has increased by quite a bit. I'm not seeing this as a welcome change, given learning to parry is one thing, but learning to not attack based on the potential of an enemy parry is something else. I don't feel it's communicated well enough, or at least I was struggling to see it. While you might agree with my assessment of the game as a worthy commendation of its identity or the very reasons it lacks luster compared to its predecessor, it's clear Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin is its own beast. While this closes the chapter of Dark Souls 2 for me, I've had a lot of fun during my months-long adventure through the main game, as well as the Lost Crowns DLC, all of which bring interesting changes and innovations on the established template. My fears are elated. I'm not scared of Dark Souls anymore. While I'm always proceeding with caution, I'm excited about dipping into the Souls experience again. Speaking of, it's now a case of looking forward to the next entry in my journey. Do I proceed into the land of Lothric for Dark Souls 3 next, or take a sojourn into Yarnum and experience Bloodborne for the first time? Check the poll in the card up top, I want to know what you all think I should play next, though I imagine we'll get some hearty arguments for both games in the comments. Thanks for watching this episode of Design Dive here on AI and Games. It felt appropriate for the 10th episode of my quirky wee sub-series here on the channel that I returned to Dark Souls, which is, at the time of writing this episode, the most successful video of Design Dive to date. I hope you've enjoyed my ramblings on Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin. If you really like my ramblings, you should support them by joining the AI and Games Patreon or by becoming a YouTube member. I need this support to continue to make this content and I'm indebted to the names you see on screen here who help make it a reality. Check out the links on screen and in the description to see how you can help AI and games continue to grow. In the meantime, stay safe, have fun, I'll be back.